Welcome back to the Sharing Jesus podcast, where we share stories, awesome ministry moments, and everything in between. I am your host, Caleb Reese, or no, it's not. It's Rob. Caleb is out today. I'm your special guest host, and joined with me, we got our associate pastor, Sean Collins. Hey, Rob. We got Spencer running around somewhere with us as well today, a little guest on the show. Superman. And today's episode, we are interviewing our pastor, Dr. Michael Reese. How are you today? Yep, we're both, uh, we're all three tired. We put in a full day. It's a Thursday, recording this on a Thursday, but uh, glad to knock it out at the end of the day. Hey, I tell you what, I'm super excited about this. Been looking forward to it. It was just today that I learned a couple of new things uh, about our pastor. So they may come up on the show. I don't know. Might we'll come see. up. We'll see. So let's just get started here. Our listeners are probably thinking, you know, hey, I know everything there is to know about my pastor, but I guarantee it's not. This man is still telling us new stories all the time. So just real quick, catch us up. Michael Reese, what was it like growing up? Where? And uh, just just start there. Sure. Uh, it was a cold, dark, rainy night. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, uh, as Sean runs to get some copies out of the hopper, we are multitasking today. It all began in Texas, born in Lufkin, uh, really raised in Hunt, excuse me, in Henderson, Texas, get the right H town. And, uh, my parents were, uh, married and, uh, like a lot of kids, uh, ended up going through a divorce and parents divorced and, uh, two great parents, a mom and dad. Uh, James and Wanda and uh, state trooper and legal secretary. One of the th- good things that came out of uh, as God can do, he can take a bad situation and make something good out of it uh, because of the divorce. Uh, that happened when I was nine years old. When I was 10 years old, August of 1977, uh, I, mom started going to church and uh, several months before then, I started hearing the gospel, got under conviction so I grew up, uh, you know, early years, Henderson, but that happened when we were living in Huntington, Texas, and we were going to Antioch Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, several friends ended up out of that church going into the ministry. Now, I know you don't, y'all don't know these people. Uh, Lemoyne Wiggins ended up surrendering to ministry. Uh, Larry Chalker ended up surrendering into the ministry out of that church i was baptized there but my sunday school teacher i need to get a shout out even though she's in heaven uh her name is audi pounds okay. uh, she first told me about christ and she set it up to where my mom would follow up my mom led me to the lord um at home uh accepted jesus christ as my personal savior and and uh just uh so that that was the growing up years i ended up graduating uh, all my rest of my growing up years to age of 18, Huntington, Texas. And believe it or not, our mascot in Huntington, Texas was the Huntington Red Devils. So that kind of gets you through a salvation. Where did I grow up? Yes. Uh, okay. Quick side note here. Growing up, Michael Reese, what did you do for fun? Like what was your typical uh, teenage years growing up? Sports, any hobbies? What was it like? Sure. Um, of course, growing up, uh, we rode bicycles all over the place. We would ride five, 10, 16 miles everywhere. We'd ride all over the place. That was, uh, early years. And then I fell in love with the sport of basketball. And that was really my, my go-to I'd played, uh, in high school, I played two sports. I played uh, basketball and I ran track. My event was a one mile run and the two mile run long distance i tried some sprinting i definitely was not <laughs> any good at sprinting all right so i came into the uh, all i heard when i came back in uh back from getting the bulletins is is red devil at that point was there <laughs> yeah. any hint of what god was going to do as far as ministry wise yep uh good question because uh rob just said you know where'd you grow up and and uh and then i told him about where i grew up the two towns henderson and huntington and then uh, of course my parents divorcing uh of course i couldn't have had a better set of parents better or even a better set of step parents mm-hmm. and and it got saved at the age of 10 but the lord started dealing with me to uh about the ministry in late or early in my senior year mm-hmm. i was 17 years old and 
it was after basketball season had just finished in January and uh, early February, and I started really thinking about what I'm going to do the rest of my life. And there was another fellow by the name that I started talking to besides my pastor, Lamar Denby, the fellow named Carter Olds. He's already passed away too. And uh, everything, and then finally I, the Lord was dealing with me to, me to preach the gospel. I surrendered in February 17th, 1985, whenever uh, I was still a senior in high school. Uh, it, was, uh, it was one, it was, I'm so glad for that. Uh, it was no doubt. Uh, it was a definite God moment. I was searching, searching, searching my uh, Thompson Chain Reference Bible for uh, a verse that said Michael Reese is not called to preach and ended up First 1 Corinthians 1. And anyway, and I ended up just uh, on a Saturday night giving up and then announcing it that following Sunday. So that's kind of the way that went down as far as uh, when did I, you know, when did God get a hold of me on that? So, so with all preachers, there's obviously the call there, and you just went over that and that, that experience, the timing of it. Now, obviously, the next step is w- you're called to preach, but where are you going to preach, right? Mm-hmm. And so some churches I've heard of it, you know, hey, you surrender to preach uh, that morning in church. Well, you're preaching tonight. That's You know, I've heard those uh, yeah. stories. But tell us about your first church, uh, that experience, that, that move maybe. What happened after you surrendered? Absolutely. Uh, that, so I'm still in my senior year. Yes, the following Sunday, you're preaching. Oh. <laughs> and uh, so that, that next Sunday night, and most people's, and I don't know why, I, to this day I don't know why, but uh, most people's first sermon is five to ten minutes long. Mine was 50 minutes long. Had a lot to say. 50 minutes? Yes. Had a wow. lot to say. My, I think it's my second longest sermon ever in my life. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and uh, I don't know why. I do, to this day, I don't know why. That's, he married Miss Karen shortly after that, and she cut those boogers down. <laughs> Maybe so. Maybe so. She she definitely doesn't mind speaking truth. Matter of fact, uh, there's a it it is not uncommon. And she'll she after a sermon on a Sunday at lunch, she'll say, "Did you actually study?" Oh, oh wow. Hey, yeah. hey Rob, has she ever gigged you about your time? I don't. I don't know. I I usually keep it short. Oh, see, she has me. She yeah. said fifty-two minutes, Sean. Fifty-two. So even I have been subjected yeah. uh, to that. That's a uh, yeah. speaking as a true preacher's wife. She and the thing is though is that uh, she is not being mean. She, sure, she, absolutely. As a fact, she, she was wanting to help. She knew that I had had. Uh, either A, I'd had a rough week, bad week, or C, like sometimes we just have a priorities are mixed mm-hmm. up. We just get busy and we sure. don't prioritize. Mm-hmm. And uh, so back to Rob's question, um, I do a bunch of fill in I, everywhere. That's where I've got some of my crazy stories. Uh, had a fella uh, toting a shotgun in the church one time. I had a fella. Uh, I did a Lord's Supper one time for a church I wasn't even a member of. I just read the scriptures. They just did it. <laughs> they had uh, they the church had uh, Mogan David wine on one side and grape juice on the other side. And, <laughs> That's uh, church split right there. Uh, well, the church was actually they said this brings us together. We can all agree. <laughs> we can all agree on something different. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, Imagine that, the irony of that. Uh, We're all just going to agree to disagree. Right. So <laughs> cool we, stories. The, the question everybody's wanting to know is, is, which side did you sit on? Well, since I wasn't a member, I couldn't partake. Oh, and, uh, oh they, okay. Well, they, fair enough. I'm yeah, sorry. You did fill in preaching. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, that'd probably been one of the few chances I had to try that wine. <laughs> but uh, And then finally I said, you know what? I, I went to college, Stephen F. Austin State University, the okay. following fall. And uh, and God intervened. He put a fellow there that was working on his master's to be an ABA chaplain. His name was Brian Seminoes. Brian, if you ever listen to this, a shout out to God using you. Uh, he said, my father-in-law is the dean at seminary in Minden, Louisiana. And he said, uh, hey, would you like to just go visit? But it really piqued my interest. I uh, had nothing against TBI, uh, which is a school near where I grew up, Texas Baptist Institute. It just ended up I had friends at, that pointed me that way toward Louisiana. I had no ulterior motive and uh, ended up going to seminary in Minden, Louisiana, and uh, still doing a bunch of fill-in work, which leads, of course, to the 
my first ever position the summer of 86 and associate pastor and youth minister at uh, Vidalia, Louisiana. Vidalia. Okay. So where, uh, help me on the timetable as far sure. as how did you meet uh, Miss Karen? I mean, when was this going on? Were y'all already... Uh, summer of 86, just a... I had already been called to that position the, like okay. a week before. I knew we were close. I just yep. didn't quite mm-hmm. know the timing. You're okay. right. And I went, ended up going to quitting a good job at Walmart. And uh, cause, See, that's what I didn't know. I didn't know he worked at Walmart. Yep, summer of '86. I get a start, and you uh, should have bought stock in Walmart yes, back in '86. Matter of fact, get this trivial. Uh, I was working at Walmart before they had those laser scanners. Uh-huh. We were still punching in like a cash register thing, uh-huh. and uh, of course, I couldn't. Uh, to me, that was a toy. When we, they installed those lasers, especially the <laughs> wands, I, I was shooting that thing everywhere. And, uh, That's- and uh, sorry, why I had to quit? Did you quit or get fired? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And matter of fact, I showed him. A, uh, I ended up uh, giving them two weeks' notice. They gave me a going away gift at the end of the day, a set of cross pins with my name engraved on it. Huh. I've still got them. Cool. And it's from the summer of '86. And uh, like you said, when did I meet Miss Karen? Hmm. Uh, quit that job. Went to a uh, church camp at Bog Springs. Never been to Bog Springs in my life. Summer of 86, met this uh, beautiful, short brunette by the name of Karen Wilkes, and uh, the rest is a lot of history. rest is a lot of history. I mean, a lot of years. So real quick, as we wrap up this segment one, uh, you, you'd you mentioned Stephen F. Austin, and now you're living in Arkansas, and it's all about the Razorbacks. Uh, growing <laughs> up, was there a school? Like now, it's like Texas all the way, Longhorns. Now it's the Texas A&Ms, and there's some smaller schools of, you know, TCUs, uh, mm-hmm. uh, Baylor's have came up. What was your college? Like what was – what was your big like like what 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 flag was in the bedroom <laughs> well matter of fact my brother-in-law michael wilkes has harassed me about that because everywhere i've lived i've swapped colleges where i pulled for and it and i thought about why did i do that and i'm thinking the whole time growing up we were not into college sports okay it was always the dallas cowboys Oh, uh, that, that's that all. was your team? That well, was it. That's what I was going to ask. Is that kind of living in Texas? Is that where the whole Cowboys yes. love affair happened? It, it's still, it a, it's a, you know, people love them or hate them. And, and I, I love them. I've stuck with If I can pastor in the middle of Louisiana in 1989, the year they go 1 and 15, and live in the state of Louisiana, and pastor in the state of Louisiana, the year they lose to New Orleans 28 to nothing that year, Troy Aikman's rookie year, and remain a loyal, dedicated fan, I can, I'm through. All the way, silver. I bleed silver and blue. Absolutely, right. and of course, uh, you know, good things are coming for the Cowboys. Of course, the mid '90s, and we know as we continue the talking about ministry, we know God's got great things in store for you as well. So, how Absolutely. about them Cowboys, and how about Michael Reese? Oh, That's right. Boy. So, as I don't we know wrap about, up, how about Michael Reese, but as we wrap well, how about up, God, segment, but, yeah, you know. yeah. We're wrapping up segment one here. Uh, You guys can take a break wherever you're listening on your way to work, and uh, we will be right back. And we're back for segment two as we learn more about our pastor, Michael Reese. So in this segment, we're going to continue into your ministry experience. We got in the first segment to your first church of some stories there. We're going to also talk about cool ministry moments for you, uh, family life, and then any words of advice or encouragement that you have for our listeners. So just catch us up. Uh, We know you're at your first church now. Let's start right there. Take us through the early years of your ministry. Sure. And um, just, you know, the good Lord was working. I'd met Karen right before I took that very first position. Actually, I'd been called to it, uh, moved to Vidalia, Louisiana. That was tough, three hours away from Bossier City, but I was still attending seminary and uh, full-time down there at Vidalia, Louisiana. 
but of course uh, missing her and as soon as i get there i'm hoping to be mentored by an older pastor brother david mccormick who's also gone on to be with the lord uh, but he ends up going on the mission field and so i become at at uh, 19 years old an interim pastor while being the youth pastor and anyway and helping a church find a pastor it was a great experience for a 19 year old thrust in that position preaching every sunday while on the phone on old landlines calling people <laughs> uh and and say hey will you come to vidalia end up getting an arkansas boy by the name of bill birdsong he came down there as our pastor he was uh, at that time at east union under john williams and uh that's uh, of course uh, kenny and tony and all them's dad and terry uh, uh terry don and uh, good friends of mine and so I ended up moving back to Minden, Louisiana, which is great because I'm that much closer to Karen. And, of course, just falling in love with her. About uh, nine months later, I'm my very first church. My uh, No, nine months later, I see Rob's eyeballs. <laughs> Nothing happened nine months later except I became my pastor of my very first church. In December of 87. The birth pangs began right there. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> the birth pains of ministry. Using nine months as a figure. But uh, so I, I began pastor in February, excuse me, uh, uh, December of 87. And uh, New Raymond Missionary Baptist Church. I married Karen in August of 89. So almost two years I'm pastoring there at New Raymond Missionary Baptist Church. Now, of course, you may can do this for, for all of them quickly, but, I mean, what was going on there for those two years as far as you were pastoring? What were you experiencing? I mean, I know you were getting the ropes down. I know that you had probably had some people that were really um, trying to encourage you as a young pastor. Were y'all were y'all growing? Were you, I mean, kind of what were you experiencing during this time? I, you know, I never thought about that, but uh, as far as the church didn't really grow that much. This church was so far in the— middle of the woods they had to pop in sunshine <laughs> it was it was way in the middle of the woods and uh out of castor uh louisiana and uh so it it was back there so we stayed pretty much the same we didn't go anywhere so anyway so then i uh we ended up getting called to my second bivocational church and uh that would be hope missionary baptist church in uh heflin louisiana and so, which is a small town outside of Ringgold, Louisiana. All of this is south of Menden. And while there, ex we experienced, Karen and I do, in June of 1992, the birth of our first child. And so Taylor Ann was born that, uh, that summer in June 16th, 1992, end up getting uh end up resigning without a church uh now okay. i had a, i had an older pastor tell me that i made a mistake in doing that uh, yeah uh, which i i felt very at peace in resigning i had a job full-time job at the sawmill i was a log yard foreman at uh, it was called the royal martin uh, sawmill there in castor louisiana and so i had you know good income and uh, besides pastoring that church and so uh when i got called and this was a tough one i you know being young uh at that time 22 years old when my daughter well i was 22 and i got married so i was 25 when she was born um and so i'd only made 150 dollars a week that was my most i'd ever made as a pastor big money i mean and uh this church in houston called me and uh it they offered me like five hundred dollars a week, all kinds of benefits and everything, but I didn't feel led to go there. Ended up going to uh, First Baptist Wells, Texas, uh, for quite a bit less money. Yeah, and that was my very first ever full time position. Got called there in um, November of ninety two, and so that was my very first full time job right there. So got one child. Very first full time church of full time church in Wales, Texas. Yep, full time church. So, so, so now you're a family established full time pastor. What was it like switching over from uh, part time or bivocational to full time ministry? That's 
a really good question because uh, uh, I found out and probably I rocked on about three years of just trying to find a, uh, a, a skit. Nobody had ever taught us that in seminary. You're taught, we were taught basically how to, there were a lot of pastoral things, but not really anything about how to manage your time. We did not have a course on managing time. Uh, I did that pretty well. Karen's a huge aid. I'm a big procrastinator. She's a natural organizer. So being able to procrastinate and all to, so I've struggled managing my time. Matter of fact, uh, let me go ahead and give this anybody listening out there. That's a minister. Um, I, I realized that I was, and I, the Lord convicted me. I was really doing a good job of procrastinating my preparation time. I could just get up and wing a sermon on 5 a.m. on Sunday morning, and uh, the Lord convicted me about it. I wasn't putting in the prep time, and because of that, a habit that I've started, I've had it ever since that uh, whatever month it was in 1995, I started putting a general outline of my message in the bulletin to make myself disciplined to have that done early and finished. Uh, and I never minded keeping up that habit. I've done that that long. And uh, because of that, me learning how to manage my time uh, back at my first full-time church. And like you said, it was a learning process how, yeah. to, how to manage Nobody had ever taught you that before mm-hmm. to develop in your own habits. And so if that's 95 that I did that, I remember it clears the bell. Uh, Caleb's not going to be born until 97. We struggled okay. Uh, uh, Karen had some uh, uh, fertility issues, and she so we didn't know if we were going to have another child. And uh, but the good, the good Lord ended up blessing us two more. All right, all right. So, so Sean, we have caught up now. He's at our his first full time gig, family of three at the time. And so, you just talked about Caleb. He's the one that's missing today. Yeah. And uh, so, so just catch us up on Caleb, and then Allie, and then just breeze through to where you are right now. Sure. And uh, the good Lord blessed with several years there. Uh, Allie and Caleb were both born at the same hospital I was born at, uh, Woodland Heights. Uh, church church <laughs> hospital not a feel like you're born at a church but at a hospital in lufkin texas and um end up in the year 2000 that would be uh august of 2000 getting called to central missionary baptist church in uh, rogue gully louisiana actual town is pineville but the community is rogue gully and i was there five years uh kids grow have a good ministry there uh, uh it's uh a few struggles here and there, but overall, it was a really great ministry. Great people at Central and Pineville. Uh, it's great to pastor in the middle of Louisiana. It's a unique culture in the yeah. middle of Louisiana. And uh, anyway, that my next church is first time ever to Arkansas. And so uh, March of 2005, I, I moved to Hamburg, Arkansas. So I moved from a, a suburb to way out in the middle of a cornfield, <laughs> it's it's in the middle of a cornfield, all right. It is literally, and he, Rob has been there. Matter of fact, he met the love of his life there. And uh, in yeah, Hamburg. actually, it wasn't until just a couple of years ago that that pastor took me down there yeah. and gave me yeah. a tour. Yes, yeah. and it is in the middle of a cornfield. Yeah, corn, yeah. F- corn on one side, a cemetery on the other. That's right. My That's longest it. ministry uh, in my uh, in. All of my life or ministry, whatever you want to call it, is almost 11 years, right at 11 years there. And uh, it was a great place for the kids to grow up. Mm-hmm. It's a great school system. Full of uh, The church is full of great people. Uh, it, it is true. And I left on uh, tremendous, well, all my churches on tremendous terms. Uh, so I was very, very thankful to raise a family in Hamburg, Arkansas. And so, like you said, to get to here where I'm at is, uh, we move here in, uh, in 2015, uh, September one is very first official day here. Yeah. And, uh, Allie had just started the 10th grade at Benton. And so we've been here for, uh, coming up on six years uh, yeah. here in Benton, Arkansas, Sharon Missionary Baptist Church. And so Caleb is finishing up his senior year. Uh, his senior year, he was homeschooled, and uh, he had already surrendered the ministry. 
And so we'll interview him later and find out about that. But uh, he had already surrendered the ministry before we got here. And so now we've been here so all this time. All right. So you have called us up to now. So, Sean, uh, uh, as, as, as we learn from him back and forth, we are uh, hearing weekly about these stories that Pastor has and all this life experience. So, so tell us, uh, just just give us some cool stories, maybe some ministry moments that maybe Sean and I have not heard about yet. Well, I didn't know I was going to get this question, <laughs> which y'all both heard. I think Sean was in there uh, when the interview with Shane on a totally different podcast about the the WWF event uh, <laughs> that happened behind the pulpit, and the fellow tried to kick me out of the pulpit. Fortunately, I won. And uh, fortunately, he wanted to preach about the Holy Spirit, and I found out the spirit he really had was the spirit of Jack Daniels, so he was intoxicated. But that happened at the First uh, Baptist Church in Wells, Texas. Uh, a fellow, during the service, while I'm preaching, comes up and tries to take over. What I want to know is, is where were all the men? Like, how did he even get to the stage? Well... They were eating that, popcorn. They were eating popcorn. <laughs> and uh, I asked was, one of the men later, what, I said, why didn't you do anything? He said, well, you look like you were handling all right. Oh. <laughs> Pastor's yeah. official and, record is 1-0, and oh, just one in case know. anybody wants to challenge him. And they're, they're, the, uh, that was on a Wednesday night service, so there wasn't a huge amount of men in the audience. It did scare all the ladies to death. Absolutely. Uh, the kids were out back in the fellowship hall. They were doing a, a Bible study, so... That we had some adults and some a uh, bunch of kids back there, so there weren't any kids in there. But the women thought we were being robbed, and they were <laughs> they were hiding their purses and their their stuff under the pew. And, and so, so, if you're listening, if you're sharing night, if you are uh, a deacon in another place or part of a, another team, uh, don't leave the pastor to handle it by himself get up there and help him get up there and help him turn it into a tag team match that's right and absolutely right. of course i briefly mentioned about uh that church i was doing some fill-in work in shelby county texas yeah. and uh so about the uh, church and they didn't have a pastor and this church was so uh letter of the law the they they take the lord's supper on the quarterly basis yeah and uh so they were they didn't have a pastor, but they're going to take the Lord's it's, Supper. They said, uh, "Preacher, we know you're not a member here. We believe in closed communion. So, uh, would you just read the scriptures, and we'll take care of passing it out?" I said, "Well, you know, I never thought about that, but, but sure." And uh, so I said, "I'll read the scriptures, and y'all, uh, as a church, observe the Lord's Supper together." And uh, so I went with the the man I was uh, staying with that afternoon, and we went up there to start the. He's getting all that stuff put out on the communion table, and he drug out a, a can or a container of Welch's grape juice and a bottle of wine. And so I said, what is this? And he said, well, we a long time ago, we uh, had, uh, you know, we were trying to figure out, we were trying to make everybody happy. Said uh, some of them believed in real grape, excuse me, real wine. Some of them believed in, in grape juice, and so they actually poured two trays one full of wine and one full of grape juice, and they observed the Lord's Supper that night in unity. Wow. You ever reckon that, they got it mixed up? <laughs> and swapped them? I, I think they would find out instantly. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, that's, wow. a good, that's a neat uh, wondering. But uh, there's other stories like that. Uh, just like uh, one time I was filling in, not filling in, it was seminary night. And uh, this was, I was helping out, uh, filled in at, uh, for, not filling in, but seminary night, uh, Wayne Watson Church, and uh, his, uh, where he was at, and they had a, a baptism. And this fellow, this older fellow got baptized, and they had just had some baptismal robes made, and the homemade baptismal robes, and they didn't put any weights in the bottom of the robe. And, oh, uh, boy. Yes. <laughs> But he, nobody told him to wear clothes <laughs> up under there. And so when he come in the water, his, oh. his gown floated up. Well, he was standing on the wrong side of the, of the baptistry. <laughs> they moved him. He, the pastor did not notice that he, what is going on. He moved him to the other side so he could put him on his correct hand. And we got a flash of his rear end cheeks, his butt cheeks, as they went across the glass. <laughs> 
Yes. Pressed and, against the glass. <laughs> yeah. And of course, the, oh, past, the pastor immediately realized everybody was rolling <laughs> in the whole church. <laughs> Everybody's rolling, so he like immediately, he quickly <laughs> baptizes him. I mean, he says, uh, "I baptize you, my brother." And then, blah, 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 boom! He he put him down and uh, dunked him and shoved him out of that baptistry. But uh, that was one of the most memorable baptisms I've ever seen. I hate to even say the word "seen" in my life, but uh, that, that's wow. that was, they had to clean the glass afterwards. <laughs> Yeah, glass cleaner. That is yeah. good. That is good. Wow. You, you, the fellow, <laughs> hey, listen to this. We all waited. There's about 15 of us visiting and wait for that gentleman to come out. He was such a good sport. He was about early 70s. Everybody's so proud of him. Oh, wow. He, yes, he got saved. He's getting baptized in his early 70s, and That's... he realizes what happened. <laughs> And uh, he did not have any clothes on underneath the robe. He should have wore the bathrobe or the baptism robe out. <laughs> oh, my. And, and wore it the rest of oh the my. service. So is that where all the instructions came in for both uh, male and female? you got to be clear. that ta- This probably falls under the advice section as far as make sure that the baptismal candidates know what to wear. Or know what to wear. Especially Absolutely. if you're going to use uh, baptismal robes, tell them. Keep clothes on underneath. Yes. That's in the next instru- baptism, did they have the robe still, or did they? <laughs> they had some weights in them. Okay, they, put some weights in them. I said, we, uh, I don't know who made them, and uh, but they were homemade. Wow. Yeah. So you've been preaching for a long time. I'm, I'm just curious. I mean, kind of a moment here, but what is like? Have you ever just like had a preaching moment, like tongue tied, or say something that, you know, you just kind of had to. Not on purpose, of course, but almost oh, just had yeah. to shut it down. I have, matter of fact, uh, that that m- brings up a neat memory. Uh, one one of them I had to apologize for uh, is that, and it was a simple tongue tied brain fart moment. And uh, I had Satan on the throne for a thousand years during ah. the millennium, and I was just preaching, preaching. And they said, "Preacher, you realize what you said." Because I, I was probably talking about Satan on being loosed mm-hmm. at the end of the thousand years. The mm-hmm. Bible mentions that little eschatology. The other thing, as far as a embarrassing moment that you just mentioned apologizing for, my very first church. I think I have not been married yet. I'm, you know, and you're trying to as a young preacher, you're trying to emulate other pastors, use all of the levers and mechanisms that you can. So you know that. Uh, the old thing you do, or if you've seen preachers do at the invitation time, okay, as the pianist continues to pray, I mean, play softly, as we bow our heads and we, you know, you're kind of set in the mood to c- contemplate the message that you just heard. And I uttered these words. Now, before I say what I said next, this old church was a older building, a cinder block, concrete floors, wooden pews and right around uh each end of the choir loft is a door that leads to a short hallway and there's a restroom at the end right around the corner of the choir loft i think and, i've heard this before. oh this yeah is good. <laughs> i utter the words i said as we listen to ever what the spirit is saying right now and all of a sudden, a toilet flush. <laughs> Kadoosh. And uh, that basically killed that invitation. Wow. wow. Because Talking of that about echo. about flushing it yes. down a drain. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> and so, yes, I've had some interesting invitations. Uh, I've had some interesting sermons. Of course, the fellow, you know, uh, I've started a sermon one time. Uh, this was at Promised Land. And uh, started a sermon one time. One of our older ladies had a heart attack right there. And and when that happens, uh, you know, you just, right when you see it happen, they fall over their attendant. To her. You don't keep preaching. You just say, hey, listen, uh, we've got a medical emergency right here. You have a short word of prayer. And you just say, hey, let's pray for. And, uh, you know, I literally prayed for her as a closing prayer. Mm-hmm. And uh, I said, "Have anybody called?" And I said over the PA system, "Has anybody called nine one one?" And so, you know, uh, middle of there at Promised Land, the middle of the uh, Wana night, one time the auditorium catches on fire. Oh wow! 
Yes, uh, volunteer or fire department, or the, excuse me, the fire department from Hamburg comes out. They're spraying water inside the attic of the auditorium at Promised Land, putting out the fire up there. And then I'm, I'm what thinking, were the teens doing there in VBS that year? <laughs> yeah, well, fortunately, none of them were over there or in the attic. It okay. was a yeah, and we could not get up there. So that was a uh, just a whole host of odds and end uh memories and uh that we could re- recollect all right well well as we're getting ready to close there's one more little segment that we're we're going to give you it's just called word of advice sean and i we both get to learn a lot from you, you uh-huh. get first hand experience from michael reese and you know you're you were my greatest mentor that i have you know you're the one that baptized me uh, uh married me and haley uh i just called me to my first church here at sharon so uh look up to you uh get a lot of advice from you uh, Sean does too. I know that. Absolutely. And so, uh, for for all our listeners, what what's maybe something that you would just put your stamp on, stamp of approval? Uh, and you might can mention a few things. So, just word of advice or encouragement that maybe people don't get to hear from their pastor every day. Yeah, and then if I can just piggyback, of course, um, you were what would like Michael Reese like. If you could go back and tell yourself as a young pastor, knowing what you've been through and what you've seen and, and what you've seen God do, uh, what what would that be? Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Well, to answer the, the first question that uh, I watched a lot, and I see it today uh, happen, and I think, I don't know, it was just kind of, uh, I must, the Lord must have put it on my heart or, or what have you, and that I was very... Uh, uh, always thankful and patient that I did not have to have uh, uh, the you know b- to be the pastor. I didn't have to have the lead position. I didn't have to. Yes, I started out early, and a lot. I've had some people say, "I wish I could have done what you did here, did there." But I felt like I was very patient in waiting for God to open the doors. Mm. Uh, I didn't always, and also another thing, I tried to be, and I haven't always had, I've, I've had lots of moments of discontent, but uh, I, I've always told myself to be patient and to wait and be content where I'm at. That's a good word. And I felt like if I, if I wasn't content, the old saying, yeah, bloom where you're planted, that's a, that's a good one. But if I wasn't content where I'm at, um, uh, then how can God use me in the next spot? I'll probably be not content there eventually if I'm basing it on physical stuff. Yeah. And so, yeah, mm-hmm. there's been lots of times where I've had to fight that. Uh, but as far as telling myself, uh, uh, I'd probably, uh, if somebody asked me one time, would I do anything different? I don't know much that I would do differently in the ministry. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Lord has been so kind and mm-hmm. gracious to me i have had a lot of struggles and difficulty with uh, uh tackling uh, the lord seems to have led me to different churches that uh are have have uh different issues or maybe different hurdles with i call them people problems and uh and i'm thankful the lord's wired me in such a way that uh i can tackle difficult uh, situations and and not get in too big a hurry mm-hmm. just take my time and and uh kind of wade down them so that uh, as far as going back uh, i said just hang in there mm-hmm. uh because uh he talked about be, do not grow weary mm-hmm. and doing good things doing well mm-hmm. uh, so to not lose heart it says in another place and uh so that that'd be some things and advice I'd give. All right. So guys, it has been fun today. We are missing our host, Caleb. He will be on the show and we're gonna learn about his story and his call pretty soon. So listeners, thank you guys so much for joining in. We pray that you have been encouraged and uh, we we possibly share some tips or tricks that can help us all to continue this mission of following Jesus, loving others, and reaching the lost. <laughs>